Chicago Walkers. I stay in the rest of the Seaway Valley. Good morning and welcome to a live edition of CKI uh, Wednesday to Atala. My name is Reen Cook. We remind you of views and opinions expressed by our guests and our callers during uh, the Duatala, not necessarily those of 97.3 CKIOM or the Aquazaste Communication Society. And uh, we do have a uh, time uh, limit uh, this morning with one of our guests. So we're going to... So we're going to get started uh, with that uh, and uh, get right into it. We're having a discussion today about Omicron, uh, the COVID-19 virus and the Omicron variant, what that means for Aquazaste. And today's program is uh, focused uh, with uh, health and leadership officials from the northern portion of the community and also across the water in the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, which is uh, what uh, Aquazaste uh, under MCA uh, follows uh, majority wise uh, with regards to the COVID precautions, guidelines, uh, and information of that sort. Uh, so with that, we have three guests joining us today. Uh, Dr. Paul, uh, he is uh, Dr. Paul Romoliotis, and he comes to us from the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. We also have Dr. Horn, who comes to us from De Honigunluago, the Holistic Health and Wellness Program, and also Mohawk Council of Akwazase, Grand Chief Abram Benedict. So all three guests joining us today to provide some uh, current factual information with regards to Omicron variant, uh, the COVID-19 virus. So uh, we do have uh, Dr. Paul only for a limited amount of time. We've only got about uh, uh, 12 or 13 minutes with him. So we're going to quickly go to our welcoming and opening remarks from Grand Chief Abram Benedict. I'll tell everyone that this program is being streamed live on the MCA Facebook page. If you have questions for our panel, you have to call them into the radio station at 518-358-3427. 613-575-2101. And with that, we welcome back to the airwaves, the Grand Chief of the Mohawk Council of Aquazaste, Abram Benedict. Sego and welcome, Grand Chief. Sego Reen, and uh, good morning. Happy New Year to you and all of our listeners. And thank you, as always, for making some time for us uh, this morning to uh, share some information uh, with you in the community. I do want to thank uh, both of our doctors this morning, Dr. Paul Romoliotis from the East Ontario Health Unit and Dr. Ogisto Horn uh, from the MCA Medical Clinic uh, here this morning to share some important information about, uh, give us an update of where we are with the pandemic, talk a bit about the Omicron uh, variant and how that's impacting our community and impacting the community around us to share uh, some of medical perspective on that so that we can all continue to keep updated, but also make an important uh, decisions for ourselves to keep ourselves and our community safe. So with that, you know, go to all of you for listening in this morning and you know, go to our two uh, doctors for joining this morning. Now, uh, again, that is uh, Grand Chief of the Mohawk Council of Aquazase, uh, Abram Benedict. As we turn now to Dr. Paul Romoliotis, as mentioned, heads up the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. Uh, and uh, like we said, Aquazase, uh, under MCA jurisdiction, that's who we follow is the Eastern Ontario Health Unit with regards to statistics, restrictions, and guidelines. So with that, uh, we'd like to maybe get a quick uh, review of COVID-19 and the Omicron variant in Ontario in general. So sure. Dr. Paul, welcome back to the airwaves here at 97.3. It's a pleasure to be able to talk with you today. Thank you. And it's good to be back and nice to see uh, Grand Chief and uh, Dr. Horn as well. Uh, uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was just doing uh, the latest statistics, um, uh, looking at the Ontario situation. Uh, we uh, are now uh, experiencing an average of nine to 10,000 cases a day. Just to put into context, we maxed uh, our wave three at about three and a half, four thousand. 4,000. Um, we know, uh, we also know that uh, the, for some reason, the Central Health Unit region has the highest rates in Ontario right now um, of, of cases. Um, uh, and uh, however, there's some good news there. Most of the cases that we are seeing with Omicron and what we've learned with Omicron right now from Denmark and, and South Africa is that it, it came in very quickly and it left very quickly. So we're hoping that happens here as well. Uh, we're also seeing it that it's milder. It seems to be milder, milder. Uh, and, and so most of the people who get it 
uh, you have a mild symptoms, don't require hospitalization. However, the fear is that we have about 20% of our population in Ontario that's not vaccinated. And those are the ones that are most risk for getting it and getting hospitalized. And most of our hospitalizations, I'm talking 50, 60%, and even higher of our ICU admissions are among the unvaccinated. So we, the good news is that we have people that are vaccinated twice, our long-term care and, and very shortly uh, will be fourth dose. We've already given third dose to our long-term care and your retirement homes there and our, uh, us as well. Um, we're going to be delivering a fourth dose because we know that the, the boosters will increase the protection to all of the, uh, the variants, including Omicron. And so uh, if we were to have this Omicron last year without any vaccinations, we would have a disastrous disastrous death numbers. Fortunately, we are our most vulnerable are now still protected. We're going to be giving a fourth dose to re increase the booster as well, because Omicron with two doses of, of the vaccine um, respond, it, it, you can you can still get it. That, that's the, the, the problem. You get a breakthrough infection. And however, you're still protected against hospitalization. A third booster protects you even more. So that's why we're, we're pushing the third booster. And um, in terms of other things that we know about Omicron, it spreads very easily. And yes, it does infect vaccinated people. And that's a point that I want to get. It doesn't mean the vaccines don't work. I wish there was a vaccine that was 100% effective, but there is no such thing. What we're doing with this vaccine right now is even with the two doses, you're protected against hospitalization. With a third dose, you're protected against getting the infection even more and even better protection against hospitalization. So what we're trying to say now is looking at the other areas, like I said, Ontario is now at, at the upswing of the curve. Uh, we hope that it has peaked very shortly and goes down. I do believe that on the other side of the wave, uh, a lot of people will, will have um, been vaccinated three times, and I urge people to get the third dose, obviously. If you haven't got your first or second dose, please get your first or second dose. Once we're on the other side of the wave, we'll be seeing, uh, and a lot of people will have gotten infected as well, I think that we'll be able to have more protection in the community. And the good news is as well that there are medications right now that we didn't have several months ago, that when an individual, an elderly, and we also, what we're trying to do right now is protect the elderly, protect the vulnerable populations, and protect our healthcare system. And we know now that uh, there are some medications that if an elderly individual or individual with chronic medical conditions who is at risk for complications of, of COVID, uh, if we give them a pill, uh, it'll prevent hospitalizations 80% of the time. And so we now have much, we're in a much better position to be able to offset the pandemic. And I do believe that once we go up and we go down, we'll be much better on the other side. So what we're asking for everybody uh, is to continue the restrictions that are out there, limit your contacts, limit the number of people, give us some time to vaccinate third and fourth dose to our, to our you know, vulnerable populations. Uh, and you'll see that I think on the other side, it'll be better. But in the interim, you need to mask, you need to wash your hands, you need to stay at home. The other thing that we're now avoiding here in Ontario and in Canada is that we can't test everybody. We have thousands and thousands of people uh, who, are, who are symptomatic. And now what we're telling people is that if you don't get tested, if you have the symptoms, which is either cough, fever, uh, 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 loss of smell or difficulty breathing, any one of those symptoms, uh, you should stay home, assume that you have COVID because 40% uh, of the people that we test in our area are positive anyway. So it's, uh, it's out there. So what we're doing now is we're doing a, a symptom-based diagnosis so people can stay home. And, at the, and the other thing too is the isolation has changed. The isolation period has changed. I know it's different in the United States, but I know in, in Ontario side and in Canada, the isolation is if you had COVID COVID, uh, you need to isolate for five days and your household contacts need to isolate for five days if you're vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, it remains the same 10 day isolation. So overall, we're seeing, you know, we're kind of in a, in a position where the next couple of weeks will we'll tell the tale. We're, if we're following patterns from other countries, it's going to go up and it's going to go down. Now is the time to be careful, get vaccinated and still keep those precautions. All right. Uh, I know that we only have limited time with you, Dr. Paul. Uh, question on my mind is Omicron variant, Delta variant. Uh, are we going to be headed for another variant and uh, mutation wise? Uh, does that, why is that happening? Okay. Is it due to connections to the unvaccinated where the virus has a chance to mutate? Yeah, viruses, in order for a virus to survive, it needs to have a body. 
and it goes into the body and it infects our cells and it, and it multiplies and it spreads to others. And so um, uh, when you have, and what they want to do is they want to figure out ways of surviving. So uh, if they, if you give them chance, the more they multiply, the more they will mutate to better survive, to better spread. And so that's what happened. This, this uh, variant started in South Africa where they had 25% of the population vaccinated. You know, the rest were not vaccinated. And so as we start vaccinating the world, we will get less, give the virus less of a chance to spread, less of a chance to grow, and less of a chance to, to, to mutate. So in Canada, we we're, we're, have higher rates, in the United States as well, but in Canada particularly, we have higher rates. In, in Ontario, we, we will not derive variants uh, if we continue. It's the, the rest of the world. So when I talk about coming out of this, um, we will have to still be careful, but we will live with, with COVID. And if, for example, for Omicron, let's say we need to have another vaccine or another booster, right now we have the technology, we very quickly can have another booster that can protect against a, a, a subsequent variant. And so we, there is a, actually a vaccine ready, it'll be ready in March, with Omicron in it, like a booster. So we may be getting yearly boosters like the flu. It's evolving, so I can't predict it, but it may be that we might have yearly boosters to offset any new variants, you know, from coming like we do with the flu. All right. Uh, another question with regards to natural immunity. So say an individual had COVID-19, they were diagnosed, yeah. uh, they had all the testing and they yeah. had it. Uh, they made it through on the other side. Does that person have natural immunity now? Are they supposed to get vaccinated as well or will they be OK? We hear okay. people... Uh, do not want to get the vaccine and say they have the antibodies, does that bring them immunity? It might bring them short-term immunity, but not long-lasting immunity. And I'll explain why. Coronaviruses, which is the virus that, you know, group of COVID, uh, that's why it's called COVID, uh, are very, very well known for infecting you and only prompting your immune system to forget very quickly. And so uh, you can, that's why you get recurrent colds because coronavirus causes colds. And so your they don't elicit high antibody response or protection that's long lasting. And that's why we want to booster it with a third dose or a second dose, whatever, uh, because that will give you longer lasting protection than the infection itself. Now with other viruses, once you get the virus, you're good for life. You know, you're protected. But with this particular group of viruses, coronaviruses, we know that they're they are they're very what's called poorly immunogenic. In other words, they they're programmed in a way that they infect you and then they program you to forget them very quickly so they can infect you again. And that's the challenge with coronavirus. All right. Uh, any closing comments before I let you go, Dr. Paul? No, just to say that, you know, we work very closely with uh, Amoka uh, RMCA uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Leslie and her team and, and uh, everybody and, and Grand Chief. Uh, we've uh, tried as much as possible to communicate. I think, and I'm very glad that you asked me to do this. Uh, bottom line is that uh, Omicron spreads. If you're vaccinated, you're protected against getting, getting, getting hospitalized even. And a third will do it even more. In the interim, let's, you know, let's buckle down for another couple of weeks. I'm pretty sure it'll be brighter on the other side. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Paul Romoliotis. Thank you. Uh, and be safe. Thanks for your appearing today. Now, thank I'm you very Bye-bye, Ona. Bye-bye. From the heart of Akwazasti, CK on 1FM, Ring Cook with Deda Watala. Uh, we continue to be joined uh, this hour by the Grand Chief of the Mohawk Council of Akwazasti, Abram Benedict. We also have our very own Dr. Horn, uh, who heads up our holistic health and wellness program, uh, the health team, uh, and uh, looking at taking care of our community trying to make sure that our community is as safe as possible. So if you do have any questions, you can give us a call here at CKLWEN, 518-358-3427, 613-575-2101. So what we'd like to do right now is uh, review the current stats for the northern portion of the territory of Aquazaste. And uh, MCA changed the way that they're distributing those stats. So we would like to make sure that we're clear about that. Um, so that people understand uh, what's happening and why we are releasing those uh, results the way that we are. So we're going to turn now to uh, Dr. Horn. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again. We appreciate you always being there for us. And welcome back to the Airwaves. Sego and welcome, Dr. Horn. 
Oh, hello. Good morning. Um, so I am very happy to be here again. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that um, we have a lot of people here at the uh, Department of Health in particular where I work who are dealing with different parts of this, um, of this uh, pandemic, the situation here. I have continued with the other doctors to work on the clinical side of the situation, whereas um, we have a, um, the community health unit with the nurses, with Leslie and, um, and Amanda and Carol, who have been working really hard with other nurses to do all of the contact tracing and testing and all of that stuff. And so we do have um, a, a large, um, a group, everybody's doing their own part. And, um, and so sometimes it can be confusing as to where to get the information, um, but the community health unit has been working really, really closely with um, Grand Chief as well as Dr. Paul. And so um, I'm here to um, answer um, some questions about, um, about this, but also the clinical side and what's happening in our, um, in our clinics and at the long-term care centers. Do you have any? Any specific questions? You're uh, you're muted, Reen. Okay, thank you. Uh, looking at uh, the uh, the different numbers that we have, Grand Chief, do you have those in front of you? Uh, yes, I do. So just on the numbers, we've started uh, is you'll, you'll, what we call is like a dashboard that uh, the MCA puts out either daily or every other day based on the the, the numbers uh, as we receive them. Um, so we do have the positive cases that are, are the new positive cases is 12 as of yesterday. Uh, we have 20 uh, PCR active uh, cases total. Uh, total, we've had 727 under, under jurisdiction law council. Uh, unfortunately, we've had 12 deaths. One of the new uh, things that we are now reporting is the uh, positive uh, rapid test. So you may have seen the MCA as well as the Sanger Smog Tribe have been giving out some rapid tests. Ox the Oxford Smog Board of Education had given some to the children before they went on break. Uh, these are, you know, available to the community. Uh, and what we have now started doing is when people do become positive, and as you'll recall, as Dr. Paul mentioned, if you have any of the symptoms or if you are positive through a rapid or a PCR, uh, it's still treated the same. So what we are recording, uh, what the rapid test that we are receiving uh, on our monitor page that's been shared, uh, you know, through our regular means, the rapid testing is only uh, being reported once a week right now. So last week we received uh, 102 uh, calls um, that people had received a positive uh, test via a rapid test. Some of them, uh, you know, have um, gotten those tests through the Sanders Mock Tribe and some may have gotten through the Mock Council of Oxford, but we thought it was important at least that we, we collect that data and share that with the community so that they know that, you know, the number of these uh, people in our community are, are getting uh, sick and either using the PCRs or the rapids. Currently, as, as Dr. Paul mentioned earlier, they're, they're not tracking all of the, uh, you know, not doing mass testing through what they call the the PCRs because there's an overwhelming need. Now our health services will continue to test our community members, but at this point we're, we're at a seven to 10 day turnaround because what happens is when we take the, the samples here, we send it into the Ontario testing system and they are overwhelmed uh, you know, to capacity, uh, at uh, over capacity right now. Uh, so it's taken seven to 10 days. And clearly, you know, by that time, if you're vaccinated, the five days has expired already. Uh, so we're all rapid tests are being treated as a positive as well. Uh, and, and as always, we have uh, our vaccinations that um, we've administered uh, through the Mohawk Council of Access, and we're continuing to report that. And uh, as you know, we've continued to say from day one, since the vaccine's been available, we're encouraging all community members and Dr. Horn uh, and other of our health professionals have been on CKON talking about the, you know, what the vaccines mean, what's inside of them, what the side effects could be, what the benefits and, you know, uh, are of being vaccinated. So again, as Dr. Paul has said, and we have continued to say, and Dr. Horn and all of our health professionals that, uh, you know, vaccinating is extremely important uh, for people uh, for to keep our community safe, to, to ensure that the infection uh, and the impacts of it are, are minimal uh, because we don't uh, want you know any of our community members uh, getting extremely sick uh, from from any COVID strain, whether it be the Omicron or or the Delta or, or the original strain. All right, uh, we have a 
question with regards to uh, the um, uh, individual says they read on a recent MCA Facebook post that people of the same household of a positive person need to quarantine for five days. But Ontario's guidance says to quarantine for the entire time of the positive person's isolation period, which may be 10 days depending on their age and vaccination status. And the caller wants to know, are we just doing something different uh, than the Ontario guidance or um, what are we following? Dr. Horn? So what I would say is, I think it depends on the person themselves. If the person in their household who is not vaccinated and has to um, quarantine for 10 days, if, if, if the household members have been vaccinated, then, it's, then I would imagine it's just five. Um, because um, of their vaccination status. Um, as far as um, the differences, one of the things that's super important here is that every single province is doing um, something a little bit different. Every single, um, um, every single decision is made by the best information that they have at that time. And everything is a little bit different um, everywhere. Um, and so, um, it, it's also it's it's important to know that, ev that it's not the same everywhere. That's why the United States is very different than Canada. Um, it's also important to know that um, that science changes, and so it can be very confusing. And so um, science changes because um, that's the nature of science. We accept that there is uncertainty. We accept that there are unknowns, and then we try and fill in those unknowns, and we get more and more information as we go along. And, um, and so sometimes um, things can look different. Are we doing something different? Um, as, as to answer this specific question, um, I can't answer that. Maybe Leslie can, but I will say that um, everything that is being decided is for the best of this community in this context. All right, uh, shall we turn to uh, Leslie now? Uh, and uh, Leslie uh, Biro uh, joins us as part of today's discussion. And she heads up the health uh, uh, under the Mohawk Council of Aquazase, our uh, Mohawk Council of Aquazase Department of Health. So we'll say Sago and welcome. Uh, Leslie, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're on the road. So thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, be with us today. Leslie, Sago and welcome. Hi, um, how you doing? Um, yeah, I'm on the road. Um, my service is a little sketchy here. So if I don't come through, but yeah, isolation, it varies. It depends on whether the person's symptomatic, asymptomatic. So every single case that calls in, we triage it and we follow the guidance from Eastern Ontario. So the guidance is standardized. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Dr. Have, uh, Horn, maybe uh, just on that though, would it not be a person who is not vaccinated, they're, transmiss, they're able to transmit that much longer than a person who is vaccinated? Would that not be one of the contributing factors as to why the isolation period is longer? You're muted. So your question is whether or not if somebody who is unvaccinated, whether they're going to continue to shed antigen and be able right. to transmit it to um, other people? Well, yes, um, because the burden, uh, because they're not vaccinated, they're, the burden of the, um, the virus, it's, uh, it's, um, it's faster. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's faster, it's happening more, and they have more symptoms and they're able to express it and transmit it um, um, more and to a uh, um, to more people and for a longer amount of time. And so, yes, that's why it's longer. Yeah. So when you have a family member, a, a household that you have one unvaccinated, uh, they're going to be able to spread that longer, meaning that the, the likelihood of the entire household getting that is greater because we have seen households that have one member has gotten it, but the rest of the home has not because they have been successfully been able to isolate. But when you still continue to have a person in the household that can continue to pass that, the isolation period has to be that long for everybody to ensure the safety of all of them and the people when, they, when they're out of isolation. What that's about right. And that's why it's so confusing, because when you have some people who are vaccinated in the household and others who are not, um, that's where the, it gets gray. And so to err on the side of caution, you would say to vaccinate as long as the person who is um, unvaccinated has to. Would that possibly be the same for children who are not able to be vaccinated if they do come contact and the household would have to be in a longer period of time? 
I actually don't know. I think um, I think I would say yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so con sorry. On, sorry. Contagious wise, when are people contagious? You're contagious as long as you are symptomatic and you're providing and you're shedding antigen. So people who are, um, you know, who are asymptomatic are not shedding as much. They're not coughing and spluttering over all over the place to be able to transmit it. So when you're symptomatic, you, um, you, you are more contagious. Like a, a couple of days, they always uh, talk about, okay, so say we got tested on Monday, the test came back. So how far back do we go to contact our, our contacts? You know what I mean? So if I get tested on Monday, it ended up being a positive. I just found out today. And who do I contact from there? Because uh, contact tracing isn't really taking place for a majority of these cases, correct? Right. So things like Omicron, who, which um, it, they find that it's only a little bit over two days where you start to have symptoms and then can start being um, um, contagious. Whereas Delta, it was a little longer, it was like five days. And so that even changed um, the amount of time and how far back you had to go to be able to do your contact tracing. So that, that so what, what we're saying here is that there's so many little details about all this, it can get very, very confusing and, it, and we keep getting more information. And so this is part of the overwhelming frustration for everybody involved trying to figure out how, um, how to put this all together. And that's why we have to defer to people like Leslie who are have the la most important and most up-to-date information because they're working so closely with, uh, with the Eastern Ontario Health uh, Unit. Okay. Again, we're talking with Dr. Horn, also Abram Benedict, Grand Chief. And we also have uh, Leslie Biro joining us. Uh, she heads up MC Department of Health. Uh, a question uh, that I have for Dr. Paul, but we weren't able to cover it. Uh, Dr. Horn, uh, the uh, fourth booster Omicron, is it specific? Uh, uh, will Ontario or Canada move updates for second doses for five to 11 years of age, as currently they have to wait two months? So like I said, these are all things that are not in my purview. I am a physician and what I've been doing is making sure that we um, are trying to stay as up to date with our vulnerable people in the community in terms of their medication, blood work and physical exams and making sure that they don't get sick. And so that's been my focus. Um, all of these specific questions that you're asking are not for me. They are for somebody like Leslie, who has the best information. She is public health in the community and is um, the person who is most um, closely um, working with uh, Dr. Paul. So I think that would have to go to her. All right. So Leslie, um, question for you. Fourth booster is an Omicron specific. And the second half of that question, will Ontario, Canada, move updates for second doses for the five to 11 year olds as currently they have to wait two months. Okay, so um, the, the third booster is not Omicron specific. It's just the normal, what we had before. Um, and for the five to 11 year olds, it is, they're looking at that. I think it's coming in the future. I haven't seen anything firm on it, but we're starting with the 12 because the 12 to 18 year olds, the third booster, I believe they're getting in the States, but we're only up to 16 in Ontario right now, 16 and up. Okay. So the fourth booster shot that Dr. Paul referred to at the time is that fourth booster shot Omicron specific. No, That's it's not. not. No. All right. Um, a couple of other uh, questions that we have. Where can we get vaccinations on Cornwall Island or the city of Cornwall? Everywhere seems to be booked for weeks. On January 21st, we're going to have a mass clinic at the arena. Red Cross is coming in to assist with it. And we're offering both Pfizer and Moderna on those clinics. And it could be first, second, or third shot. Okay, perfect. Uh, and why is there a difference in quarantine time if you test positive? compared to if you test negative? Uh, there isn't quite that much of a difference. It depends on where you work and if you have symptoms. So every, every case is unique and everything is 
talked to in that way. Like there's algorithms that guide you to what your time limit is and how long you have to stay isolated. So it's all case dependent. It's interesting so, because, sorry, go. Doctor. I was just going to say that, that one of the uh, really um, frustrating parts of all this is that it is context and case dependent. Um, the alternative is these big blanket mandates where they shut everything down or make everybody do this or that or whatever. That's where you do everything because all of these little details are so um, you know, difficult to flesh out. So we have to go with um, um, providing um, these, um, these recommendations and different for ages, different for symptoms, different for um, um, different for your underlying vulner vulnerability status. And the reason is because otherwise we have to go back to huge blanket um, um, efforts to, uh, to manage this, uh, this uh, pandemic. And so, yes, it is very, um, it changes all the time. And, you know, we do a lot of humming and hawing because it does change all the time. This is really context specific. It depends on the situation that your family and you yourself have. Um, and that's why um, we have our community health nurses working so hard trying to keep up on top of this. Uh, I know that uh, some individuals, uh, I think maybe we're looking at those that have tested positive, their isolation or quarantine period almost seems less than people that are trying to avoid it in their home. I think maybe uh, that, that I've seen that happen where somebody ended up negative the whole time, but they were off work for almost a month just because certain people in their family or their immediate household tested positive. So then their quarantine had to start all over again. Um, you know, so it is different, uh, you know, even from uh, St. Ridges to, uh, to Frogtown, it's different in what you need to do. Um, now, another question, uh, don't you have to be symptom free for 24 hours before returning to school or work? Depending on where you work, if you work in a high risk setting, it is actually longer than that. Um, it depends on the guidance too. So it's 48 hours with any GI symptom, vomiting, diarrhea, what have you. Any GI, it's 48 hours symptom free, 24 hours for any other symptom that you have to be, you have to be well. And that actually, you have to pass the respiratory screener as well, going into our workplaces and our schools. I think it's important too, if possible, Reen, that if you're not comfortable yourself, then extending a couple of days, I mean, and you're able to, you know, the working, I mean, it's, it, it's probably advisable to do that, right? I mean, the, the, you know, we, when we're isolating and we want to not be uh, contagious anymore, I mean, we're going to be around loved ones, we're going to be around the workplace, you know, this is going to have devastating impacts, uh, you know, to, to our family, to our, you know, to our workplace. And we have to be conscious of that. If you're able, if they say, and you're not comfortable, there's fine with a couple more days. I don't see that, you know, if, if, I don't see an issue around these sort of things, right? I mean, we were, remember, in the beginning, 10 days, which is, is is quite a long time to be in your home, especially in a household of, you know, five or six people, which you just described can happen again if, you know, uh, the father got it and then they went several days and then next thing you know, the mother got it and then it kind of resets the timer for everybody. And this could go on for several weeks if you have a household of six people. Um, at that point, you know, everybody, but, you know, we have to be just conscious and very careful of our own decisions and, and how, you know, the impacts that this will have. I mean, we know that our elders and our dodos are the most vulnerable here. And the, the ones that are at home are very, you know, strained and stressed over the whole pandemic in itself. And knowing that the Omicron is much more transmissible, you know, playing it safe, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, to make sure that you are safe and anybody that you're going to be in contact is safe. Because the other thing is too, though, we have to recognize that you know the MCA is a is a massive service provider for our community, and we are struggling as well with ensuring that our workforce is is healthy to be able to continue to provide the services. And that's you know that's across the board. And never mind in the long term care and in the in the yaki sutas and, and the nurses that are that need to provide those vital services to the community. And what we're seeing is that we're not the only place that is struggling with this. Many workforces, whether it be government or private, are struggling with making sure that their workers are, are healthy and safe and not transmitting the virus to the rest of the workforce or the clients they're serving. So these are things that you know, we are doing the best that we can here at the Mohawk Council to make sure we're being able to continue to meet the community's needs, the vital services. When Dr. Paul talked about earlier, 
the um, you know the priorities are are are, are the high risk and the vital services, and that's that's in our nurses, our our healthcare, our our um, our police services, our water departments. Those are all vital parts as well that we need well healthy people uh, to continue to function as a community and. You know, this is the that's the challenge right now with the Omicron is, is that it's very transmissible. So before it wasn't as much. And now this one is and you have a slew of people getting it and, and having to be off. And it's a, it's creating a lot of strain on, on many workplaces and many homes and a lot of stress on all of our lives. And we're asking people to, you know, do your part to, to be very conscious of your actions, but as well to, to be vaccinated and to be safe and, and continue to wear the masks continue to isolate when you when you need to and and uh, you know do our part and it's it's it is uh, very tiring there's no doubt about it but it's one day at a time and we're we're getting there right and the rapid tests that we are also giving uh, are, are are helping to give an indicator as well where we're at a community spread but also we want people to be very cautious of those as well they're not a tool to use that, you know, you want to go to a birthday party that there's going to be 30 people at and you're going to swab and say you're okay and you're off and running because it doesn't, you know, it's only an indicator. It, you know, it, you could pick it up there as well. And so we are giving them out to help people make informed decisions, but also to be able to record where we're at with a community uh, with respect to the, the rapid tests. It's, it's all we have to, you know, when we talk about metrics, we have to talk about uh, individual that's for us individually as well. We have to be informed, conscious decisions to uh, continue to function as a government, as a community, and as as uh, in, uh, as people. Dr. Horn. So, yeah, I wanted to talk about the um, the the difference between the PCR and the rapid tests. So, the rapid tests are the are the little. Um, the tests that we've been giving um, throughout the community, um, and um, and you can do it at home. Now, there's something called a false positive and a false negative with every test. There's true positive, true negative, false positive, false negatives for every single test that we do. And the problem with these tests is that they have a high rate of false negatives. So you could, I mean, false um, false negatives. So you could actually be symptomatic and. Um, and, okay, a negative test does not necessarily mean that you're off the hook, but if you have a positive test, for sure, it's going to be a positive. And so that's why we're calling and asking you to let us know if you have a positive rapid test. But a negative test does not necessarily mean that you are negative. And that's why we have the PCR test. That's the next level. And the PCR test is actually sequencing what kind of virus do you have? Yes, no. And what kind of virus? Is it Delta, Omicron, Beta, Alpha? So, um, and so um, there, there's different levels, um, different, different um, uh, strengths of each test. And so that's why we say it's not a test for you to say, hey, I'm free, I can go out and do this and that because a false, a negative test does not mean you're necessarily gonna be negative. It could switch to positive a few days later. Um, you know, uh, my mom had COVID over the holidays and she had all of her shots, her boosters. She walked through it very, very well. It was very positive on the first day. And then she took it like three days later and the rapid test was negative. And she goes, so does that mean I didn't have it? What does this mean? And I said, it's because that test is not perfect, but if it's positive, it's positive. If it's negative, you know, um, you have to still use your, your, um, use your, your um, mind to figure out whether or not it's safe to go out. All right, uh, another question. Why doesn't MCA report how many recovered like the surrounding communities do? Leslie, that would be a question sorry. for you. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. I was trying to figure out how to take it off. Um, we don't, um, so we do have our active cases with our PCRs. We do have our total number of cases. So the rest of those are recovered minus the deaths. So we don't report on quarantines because that would be just way too much for us we have a small team that's way for that's way too much for us to do okay we have uh, Reed. i know that this is something that has been brought a uh, couple of our you know our updates is about you know more more reporting and uh, we're very conscious of you know leslie and her team that are you know the contact tracing and as you know dr horn and leslie have spoke about you know is not uh, 
well, when we were doing the contact tracing widely, but also the triaging, they talked about triaging. That means every person who calls in and is positive or has gone for testing is positive. You know, this is like a, you know, probably what, Leslie, 20, 30 minute, if, if not longer conversation with these people, one person at a time, right? So that there's a lot of work that's happening for every case that they're, they're taking care of. So, you know, I know that people want to understand, you know, how many have been recovered. They want to know how many people have gotten, um, have gotten, have become positive that are fully vaccinated. These are things that, you know, we, we want to be able to report, but really right now it's it's about resourcing and, and, and trying to manage, you know, our expectations on Leslie, but our The Grand Chief has uh, uh, had an interruption in his uh, stream. Uh, again, you're listening to 97.3 CKLN from the heart of Aquazasta, and uh, they might have to uh, log off uh, for a moment. Leslie, are you still there with me? I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so let's uh, let's continue with you for a little bit. Um, Leslie, yes. what is your thought? on uh, the CDC, I know you guys are Northern Portia, but the CDC uh, shrinking the isolation time, shortening that from 10 days to five days. What's your thought on that? It kind of lines up with what we've been doing right now. So um, Ontario did shorten their guidelines. Omicron, like Dr. Paul explained in all our meetings we had, the viral load, it spikes right up, but it also sheds just as fast. So that's why they shortened it. So with that, the CDC, because right now we're a mismatch with the state side and it's hard with the community on the border. So we give different isolation dates than they do. So with that, it may line up to where we're on the same page and I'm hoping we can all be on the same page. It'll make things life easier. easier. For sure, for sure. Um, another question, do they know the actual number of people walking around that are positive? Not sure where um, they're- no, Not the accurate number of people because with the rapids, you assume like they're positive, but when people are calling in, it might be their whole family who are positive. So every call might be five extra people that we're not aware of and they take the advice and, and share it with them and they're isolating, which is great. So we could have like that 102 could be actually 250. We're not sure about that. Yeah. Uh, another question, uh, this listener says they received their second shot in September. Can they receive their booster or do they have to wait the six months uh, still in Ontario? Oh, nope, they shortened it to three months now. Anyone 18 years old and old, older is a three month wait period. So we are having those clinics, like I said, on the island. It's going to be open to anybody, but you can also call Community Health and talk to Kyler and get an appointment. Okay, perfect. Um, we're going to uh, welcome the Grand Chief by telephone. My problem is going to be uh, that I'm not going to be able to have Leslie be able to hear the Grand Chief, if I'm not mistaken. So, okay. Sorry about that, Reem. Can you hear me okay? There we go. All right, good. Leslie, you and can hear him well? Yeah. Perfect. Um, As as technology goes, I think that the MCA is all of our internet. That's probably why uh, Dr. Horn got kicked off as well, has had a bit of a glitch. So we, uh, I'm using my cell phone to be able to zoom back on. But as I was saying, and uh, I just wanted to just recap really quickly, you know, I mean, we're very conscious of what people, uh, the community is asking for on the reporting, and we have to be very, uh, you know, sensitive to the hard work that our health staff is doing as well. Um, you know, if we can get to some point where we're able to start reporting that information, we absolutely will do that. All right. Uh, question for the Grand Chief. Um, why won't you consider a lockdown for Aquazaste to bring those numbers down? Yeah, this is a very, this is a good question. I mean, the challenge here is that uh, it's really about our jurisdiction, 
I mean, as you look at it now, we, we drive into the city of Cornwall, everything is, you know, all retail is at 50% uh, capacity. Uh, the restaurants are all takeout. But as we head into Messina, you know, everything is wide open uh, that you can sit in uh, those areas. So, you know, considering those factors, um, you know, if we were to say that, the, you know, the MCA is going to close down for a period of time and businesses need to close, um, given the fact that the, 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 the jurisdictions around us are not following suit, the effectiveness of, the, of a uh, action like that will not achieve its goal. Uh, can, uh, Leslie, if you can answer this one for me, can people get it more than once? Yeah, so there are people who have previously had COVID and are catching it again. It can happen. So that's the, you're not invincible if you already had COVID. Just to put it out there, like you can't think you're not going to get it again. Okay. So it's that false sense of security saying I already had it, but yeah, you can catch it again. So if someone did have COVID, they're not vaccinated but they've made the decision to get vaccinated. How long after they've had COVID can they get their first shot? They can get their first shot as long as they're feeling well and they're out of isolation. Can you get a COVID shot if you are sick? For example, you've tested PCR, nothing, it's negative. You've tested rapid, nothing, it's negative but you still have the plain old head cold. Can you get the booster then? We would like you to be symptom free. Yeah, you just gotta be symptom free. So get over your illness. Your body will be stronger that way too. Okay. Um, and I, I know that sometimes we hear the word outbreak and it's a scary word. So when we understand that Yaki Sota and Jun Kunusa Day are both in outbreak status, can you explain to us what that means, Leslie, number-wise? What constitutes an outbreak in a facility like Yaki Sutter, June, Kunusa Den? So outbreak during COVID is a little bit different than it used to be termed before. Um, COVID outbreak is anybody who tests positive. Um, it's changed over the course of it, I noticed, because it was as long as somebody else catches it, but as soon as somebody tests positive, a resident tests positive, they're an outbreak. It's so yucky sutta, yeah, unfortunately, and Jumanosita are they're an outbreak and we're just trying to support them right now. Okay. Um, so uh, looking at the uh, possibility of visiting loved ones while we're on our facilities, um, is it safe for people to go in uh, and even in existing uh, outlying uh, communities, I should say, for their different uh, um, rules that they have? Say, for example, a caregiver is still allowed to come in as long as they're masked and they have the visor and the gloves and everything. How safe is it for them to go in there if there are residents, if there are staff that have indeed uh, been you know, tested positive? Uh, What's what's your advice on people that can still go visit? Should they be doing that? Yeah, if they're going to go in and visit, they're going to visit their one person. They're going to be maintaining in their own area. They're going to be wearing their personal protective equipment like they should. So all the precautions are in there. So it is safe. Um, the residents who are on outbreak are being isolated and the staff are taking all the precautions to take care of them when they go into their rooms. Okay. And let's go to uh, Grand Chief for this one. Uh, Grand Chief, uh, money-wise, who pays for all the tests and things of that nature that are focused on COVID, the PCR tests and the rapid tests, who pays for those? Yeah, absolutely. So we have talked about this in the past, uh, a little bit about testing. Uh, as you know, the Mohawk Council has a uh, COVID um, vaccine policy, which uh, requires staff to be tested. At that time, we said that there'd be no cost to the staff because the tests were being provided to us. That still continues to be the case, as well as the uh, 
the uh, rapid tests that were recently provided to the community, the one in the small green boxes, those have been provided to us by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, so th there's no, there's no been, there's been no cost to the MCA uh, for any of those tests that have been provided out to the community and to the staff. All right. So um, I'd like to uh, uh, look to wrap up uh, with regards to uh, today's program. Uh, and I'm just making sure that I don't have anything else uh, in front of me. I believe that's it. So, um, Leslie, let's wrap up with you first. Uh, closing comments for uh, today's program. And again, if people have questions that I did not get to, I will get those to um, the Grand Chief's uh, um, Executive Assistant and the Communications Department so that uh, Leslie and uh, Dr. Horn or the Grand Chief or Dr. Paul get that information that people are wondering about or are questioning or are concerned with. So uh, Leslie, let's start our wrap up with you, please. Hi. So um, yeah, I just wanna thank you for the time and the opportunity to come on. Um, it's a difficult time for everybody. So I just want people to be kind, be patient. Um, I have a small team, like I said, and we're trying our best. So I'm just hoping everyone stays safe. And I'm hope this is going to be over soon. I <laughs> really do. But thank so, you. <laughs> all right. Take care, Leslie. Thank you so much for everything that you do behind the scenes. A lot of times we don't see the work that uh, that has to go into making sure everyone is healthy, making sure everyone is safe, making sure you've got team members that can work with the community and continue to work with contact tracing or get the testing or answer the phone for questions. It's so much and uh, it's very overwhelming. So please pass along our thanks to uh, Dr. Horn and the rest of your team, the community health program. Uh, they have just been amazing. And thanks for bending over backwards for our community. Um, we truly are uh, gifted when it comes to the services and programs that are provided to us. Uh, and everything that works into that. So thank you, Leslie. Take care and be safe, okay? Thank you so much, Reen. Yeah, I will pass that along to the team. Thank you. Anna, Anna. and Grand Chief, uh, we will wrap up with you. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that if uh, there's enough interest, we can do another program. I'm sure that uh, that will be no problem. So uh, Grand Chief, uh, closing comments. I know that we do have some vaccination clinics that are coming up as well. I don't know if you have that information uh, still in front of you. I do have a list, but uh, let's go back to the Grand Chief. Where would you like to go from here? Absolutely. Well, uh, as always, I uh, appreciate the time today, uh, Reen. My apologies. <laughs> For the technology issues. I mean, this isn't the first time we've had to uh, improvise or reboot or what have you. I do want to echo to uh, you know, my sentiments uh, to the health staff here at the MCA and all healthcare workers in and around our community. This has been an extremely challenging time. And as, as Leslie has, uh, you know, articulated her, her team there have been working, uh, you know, all through this pandemic to keep us safe, to do the contact tracing, to educate, to answer the phones, you know, to provide the vaccination clinics and you know without them and our dedicated uh, staff here at the MCA and in our in within our community we, we probably wouldn't be where we're at now so yeah I want to go to them as Leslie mentioned we do have a mass clinic coming up on January 21st uh, that will be a walk-in for Moderna and Pfizer will be at the Nolago Arena they do have uh, one happening January 17th the 19th as well those are by appointment only uh, and, you know, as we've said all along, getting vaccinated is extremely important to keeping yourself, our community, our loved ones and our, our high risk uh, uh, community members safe. Um, you know, the, we've said from the beginning that we need to be very conscious of our decisions. We need to wear masks, social distance, stay at home when feeling sick those still continue to be in place. I know that, you know, we are all losing patients. We're all tired of being, uh, having restrictions, whether it be not being to dine or not being able to travel or, or what have you. But it's, uh, you know, I can tell you that our, our team here at the Mohawk Council are doing as much as they can to keep us all safe, to keep us advised, keep us up to date. And I, 
I appreciate all of that. And I appreciate all of our community for doing their part. We've lost, uh, you know, loved ones during this pandemic. It has not been easy for any one of us. And there's been so many changes that have happened over the, over the, over the almost pushing on, you know, two years now uh, with the pandemic and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very tiring, but, you know, it's without our resilience, without continuing to support one another, without being patient, we would not be where we're at today. You know, this pandemic has taken a, you know, a remarkable toll on, on, our, on our mental health as well. And we need to be there for one another, be kind to one another and take, act, uh, you know, take a moment uh, to access some of the services or take our, you know, having a routine and something that helps all of us cope or us individually cope is extremely important during this time. And, and we need to continue to do that uh, for one another. I know that right now we're in January. It's a bit cold outside. You know, it gets uh, it's dark early. It's in and stuff like that. But you know, taking some time to re to rejuvenate individually and support our loved ones is extremely important. And I thank all of you for doing that for yourself, for doing that for our community. And we're going to keep forging forward. We'll keep uh, we'll keep we'll keep plugging away. We'll keep keep you updated. We'll keep. Uh, keep our community as safe as possible. And, uh, you know, we're going to get through this. I mean, I keep, I say that every time we come on the radio, but it, we are doing, we're doing good in, in considering everything uh, that has happened to us, considering that everything that's going around us, we're, we're doing, we're doing well. We need to keep positive. And uh, as always, Yamagoa to everybody for doing their part. And uh, thank you as always to Reen, the staff at CKON for allowing us here to uh, provide the update. So Yamagoa Reen. Yeah, uh, I did want to mention your community and quarantine program, Grand Chief, to assist community members affected by COVID-19 that have to complete their quarantine or isolation to order supplies Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., 936-1548, extension 1300. After hours, weekends, 577, uh, looks like 6556. And if you're exposed to COVID-19, be sure to quarantine as instructed by your health care provider. Uh, when you call these numbers, you need uh, the caller's name first and last, the address, contact number, the number of individuals in the household, the end date of isolation or quarantine, COVID-19 positive, or are you awaiting test results? Service available to those residing in the northern portion of the community uh, through this community and quarantine program. That would be Jisnane, Gawanoge, and Ganadago. So uh, again, thank you both for joining us today. Give our best to Dr. Horn and Dr. Paul. Uh, and uh, thank you for all that you do. Thanks to our listeners that phoned in or sent in messages uh, so that we can ask those questions and find the information that they are looking for. Uh, take care and we'll talk to you next time. Ona. And that will do it for this edition of CKI on Wednesday to Atala. My name is Reen Cook. A reminder, views and opinions expressed by our guests and our callers during the Atala.